if you've had a chance to grow up in the church or maybe even just recently even come to the Lord and you've had an opportunity to explore some of the scriptures, inevitably what you will find are things that will feel like they are contradictions. Maybe you'll read something in the word in one place and then you'll read something else or maybe you've even heard a preacher preach one thing and then you've heard a different preacher preach something else and they, they maybe seem like they are at odds with each other. Maybe they even contradict each other. And it certainly can feel like that at times. There's a couple of what you and I, uh, or what I might call uh, coffee mug scriptures. Uh, it's the ones that are literally on your coffee mugs or possibly like hanging over uh, the toilet in your bathroom or wherever you put uh, Bible verses uh, just to encourage people. Um, and uh, there is one, uh, there's a couple in there that uh, you might be familiar with. I want to read them, and at face value, it might seem like they're contradictory, but I think it's actually pointing to something that God is aiming for. John chapter 10, Jesus says uh, this famous, powerful truth. He says, there's a thief who comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you would have life and have it abundantly, or life to the full, some versions say. Incredible scripture, Jesus declaring and showing us what he's come to do to give us life and life to the full. And yet, if you were to flip over just a couple of chapters, if you want, in John chapter 16, Jesus is continuing to teach and to train and encourage. And he says, listen, behold, in John 16, verse 32, behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it's come. And you'll be scattered. He's talking to his disciples. You'll be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. He's telling them, you guys are going to abandon me, and they do. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. And I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. Some versions say, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, here's my question. Which is it, Jesus? Have you come to give us life and life to the full, or are we going to walk through life with troubles and tribulation? Which is it? Because it doesn't feel like maybe those two things are compatible. Is it life to the full, or is it tribulation we're having to try to navigate through? And the answer is, of course, yes. And amazingly, these two things don't have to be contrary in, in any way. In fact, they're actually complementary. And they're complementary because what Jesus is trying to say is you are going to go through this life and you will face hardships and mountains and valleys. And they will come. But in and through all of those, hear this. You can have life and life to the full. It's not that life and life to the full means that we'll never have hardship and tribulation. It means that all the world will be going through hardship and you will have a chance to walk through it with me. You don't have to be alone. I'll give you fullness of life. And fullness of life is the invitation to have something that no one else can create and no one else can produce. And so the question is, well, how? How do we get this full life? How do you have, if you're gonna experience hardship from time to time, and you're gonna go through ups and downs, you're gonna have questions, and why is my life going this way? And I certainly wasn't looking for that. Then how do we do that? Well, I think Jesus answers here in the scripture. And the first thing he says, if you go back to verse 32, he says, well, number one, you have the Father. Number one, you have the Father. And having the Father means having everything. Everything you need for your heart, everything you need for your mind is in the Father. He actually says, you guys are going to leave. I get it. Going to scatter. But don't worry, I have the Father. Now, this is unbelievable because this is Jesus showing 
how much he needs the Father. If you were here last week, we got to talk quite a bit about what it looks like to need God. This is Jesus needing God. But then he's also going to say, listen, you not only need the Father, but you need each other. Because what he's about to do, as soon as he finishes saying this, he's going to start praying. And not eight recorded sentences later, in John chapter 17, here is what he is going to pray in light of what he just said. John chapter 11, sorry, 11 recorded sentences later. John chapter 17, verse 11, he says, and I'm no longer in the world, and I'm going to be going But they, he's talking about his disciples, they are in the world. They're going to be there. And I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, this is, anything that Jesus prayed was always in accordance with the will of the Father. never prayed one word that was outside the design, plan, and purpose of God. And here's what he's praying. I'm asking God that you would get this group of people and that they would come together and be one. And then, so he's praying for these 12 guys. And then he prays for you and me. You skip down just a few verses in chapter 17, verse 20. It says, I do not ask only for these. So not just these boys but also for those who will believe in me through their word. If you're here this morning, you're a follower of Jesus, ask you. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Here it is. In order to experience fullness of life, Jesus is praying it right now. He's about to leave the earth. What's, and this is his final recorded prayer. And here's what he has to say. I want them, my heart cry, God, I'm asking you, Father, that they would be one. Now listen to me. Jesus is not asking for them to be, all have perfectly aligned theology. What's he saying here? That they may be one. What is he asking the Father for? He's saying, I want those who will follow me to be relationally connected in need for each other, to be brought together as a family in such a way that it will blow the minds of the world. That's what he says. I want them to be so uniquely one together, just like you and I, Father, are one, which is so supernatural. What's he talking about? Something that you and I can't even create on our own, something that God is creating for himself, this family. And what he's saying is, I want them to be connected in such a way that the world would believe that you have sent me. This is the prophetic purpose and design of what you and I might call the church, the people of God. Which brings us to one of the greatest paradoxes that you'll find in all of Scripture, and that is this. Jesus is all you need, and Jesus is not all you need. And he's made it that way on purpose. Jesus is all you need. Hear this. Jesus is all you need. And Jesus is not all you need. I'm just going to mess with your minds this whole morning. That's all I want to do is bring up all the paradoxes. And he's made it this way that we would need each other. He's designed it. That meaning if you're going to be a follower of this King Jesus who created the universe through his own words, that if you're going to do that, that you will also then be connected to each other. He's made it this way. 
meaning he's everything that you need, but you also need each other. We're gonna need each other. That This is a part of what it means to be in the design of God. You can go back to the beginning. when it go, we go, If you were a part of our Genesis series, Genesis chapter one says it with clarity. This is before the fall, before sin enters into the equation. God looks at Adam and says, huh, it's not okay that man is alone. Not okay, and so he creates relationship, and it starts with husband and wife, but it goes far, far beyond that, does it not? It isn't just that. What God is saying is we were never, ever, ever meant to be alone. There's a relational connection that is meant to take place in the lives of the people of God, and our need for each other becomes part of our makeup as to what it means to be an image bearer. You're asking the question, what does it mean to be an image bearer? It means, well, we need God, but also we have to have each other. We can't do this life alone. We often talk about how sin has separated us from God. You've heard that. Sin separates us from God. Newsflash. Sin did the same thing with each other. It broke apart the relationship we were meant to have in this life It messed things up. Adam and Eve, all of a sudden, they had enmity between them. They experienced that for the first time after the fall, after sin enters into the equation. It's the same for humanity. And yet, God has designed us as image bearers that we have to need each other in order to have life and life to the full, to be uniquely one, to be connected in with each other. Now, here's the problem. We love us some independence, number one. And two, we hate us some neediness. Now, let's be real. When we talk about the human condition, we love independence. We got a whole declaration talking about it, all right, in our own country, okay? <laughs> love independence, and we hate Loathe even the idea of being needy. But there is a truth here. You and I cannot escape. We said it last week. You and I need God. And for better or for worse, he's made it so you and I need each other. Rather than relying on God and relying on each other, we often seek independence and we think that it will will have it through isolation we'll pursue it out or another way of saying is this what we really don't want to do is have to share our struggles and to share our fears even as i'm saying this you're like oh my gosh this is a horrible sermon And share our anxieties and share our hurts and share even our victories sometimes. We don't even want to do that. And it seems like isolation is the better pathway so we can just kind of keep it all here. And I think even what is taught not even always as explicitly, but I think often implicitly taught is you don't need anyone. You don't need anyone. You could be okay on your own. It's humanity's way of self-protecting. It's humanity's way of going like, if I'm gonna be okay, then I'm gonna have to build up these walls so that no one can hurt me. If you've gotten to be in church for any number or any amount of time, Uh, This often happens. We call it church hurt. But the truth is this. The church is just a bunch of messy people. Same as the world. The difference is the church has finally just opened their eyes and gone, oh, crud, I don't have it. I need someone else. We need Jesus. But that's the reality is that we often want to maybe puff out our chest and say, who needs you anyways? As a, as a form or a way of self-protecting. And it's, all we're trying to do is to keep away the hurt and rejection we tend to feel in humanity. And I, I think we, if we were all willing to dig in a little bit, we've all felt that before. 
we felt and what we know both deep down here in our heart and all throughout the word. That style of isolationist, self-protecting living never works. It never works. We actually can't live fully in all that God has made us to be and to do all that God has made us to do isolated and alone. Can't do it. It won't work. God simply did not make us to be beings who wall ourselves off from the rest of the world. It effectively shuts down real, full living. When Jesus says, I came to give you life and life to the full, Part of his design was for us to be able to live in it together. And so rather than asking God, God, all right, I'm going to go on a journey with a group of people. And I need you to protect me all the way through because I'm going to be relating to and connecting with people who will probably fall short at times. And probably not be perfect at times. And probably hurt my feelings at times. And probably disappoint me at times. Even in through the midst of that, God, will you protect my heart so that I can live fully with you and with others? Will you let me do that? Will you protect my heart, God? Not me protect my heart. Because what does Jesus say? Remember, you can take heart. Why? Because I've overcome the world. He's not saying, hey, while you're in the world, you got to overcome the world. Man, that's exhausting. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I've overcome the world. So I'm asking you to trust me and go on a journey. And you're going to need me and you need each other. And I think there's something really powerful for us to receive when we awaken to the fact that we as image bearers of God, we're made to need each other. We just got to have it. And I'd be gut level honest. If you don't think that I've had to awaken to some of these realities, man, I'm telling you, I'm as human as they come. I've had to awaken to the fact that it's the easiest thing in the world to want to self-protect, put on the mask, and act like everything's okay. And just keep on moving forward. Felt that relationally? I'm sure you have too. We've all felt it. We can do this. All the time. We do this in all of our relationships. We do it in our marriages. We do it with our children. We do it with our friendships. And it's the easiest thing in the world to try to self-protect from being hurt rather than saying, God, I'm going to bring my full self to you and I'm going to be real with my fellow man. That's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do. And yet, if you want life and life to the full, it's necessary there's a call to fully live, right? To be able to walk through, not to have to self-protect, but to trust God as we live this life together. Not to pretend that we don't need or pretend that we're okay. Because hear this, um, pretending that everything, hear this, pretending that everything is okay when it's not okay, that's a robbery for you. It's robbery. We need each other. We need encouragement, support, life. We're going to talk about just a few things I think God has put into the human framework to need. But we know this because life shows us this. The scripture shows us this all the time. Food, water, and shelter, and clothing, those are necessary for life. But here, that's the bare minimum for living, isn't it? It's the bare minimum for living. When are we thriving? When do we thrive? When we're in relationship with each other. When we're seeing God do amazing things in and through us. It is the human need actually for connection. This driving maximum human flourishing. That's where it actually comes from. Where we experience the best and the greatest is when we're thriving in relationship with each other. Certainly in marriages and with our kids and with our parents and all of those places. But it's far beyond that. And we know and experience that because it's in the absence of relationship or where we're hurt through relationship. Those are some of the hardest wounds to, to get past, right? You can miss a, 
Maybe you can find yourself hungry and move on to the next one. But when you miss out on relationship or when you feel hurt through relationship, those are some of the places that are where the deepest wounds are. And so the reality is, is we find ourselves coming back to this place where relating to each other is a part of our dynamic. It is a part of our makeup as image bearers. We need each other to bring life to each other, to encourage each other. And so the question is, well, what are the core needs? We just want to have, I'm, there's many more than what you and I could get to on a, in 20 or 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. But I want to just give us a few of these things that the scripture is going to speak to. What are the needs of the human heart and how we can actually meet them with each other? What are the core needs? Number one, you and I need, need, need to belong. We, get, we got to have it. We've got to belong to and with each other. We belong first to God. We talked about it last week, but we also have to belong. We got to find our people, right? Romans chapter 12 says, so in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member, what? Belongs to all the other parts. We belong. Meaning this, you and I were made to have a tribe, made to have a people, we're made to have a family that even extends outside of our blood relatives, just people to belong. We have it first with our families, right? Thank God for moms and dads. And thank God for spouses and children. Thank God for these uh, centerpieces for human relationship and thriving together. God willing, you had that experience in your families. We don't always have that. That's why this is good news because there is a family that God is building that extends far beyond just those right in your home. We gotta have more than just that and you know this well because you know this. If you've been married for more than four seconds, you've figured this out. Your spouse and your children cannot possibly meet all your needs, can do it. And many marriages have come crumbling down by those that are expecting their spouse to meet every need that they have. Can't be done. Your, your, our God did, did not make us for that. We can't do it. Gotta have more connection than that. And so God's saying, okay, you got to have your tribe. So it's time to find your tribe. Who are your people? Who are you walking with that you can be real with and talk to? Who you can belong to? Find your place. Secondly, you and I need to matter. So we need to belong, but we also need to matter. We got to have a people, but we got to matter. Um, the scripture is going to say something kind of amazing. It says this. You were chosen and you were designed before the world began to matter. Ephesians chapter 1 says you were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That's how serious God is about you. Chosen, picked, created before the foundation of the world. Chosen in Christ. And then Ephesians 2 says it really succinctly this way. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. In other words, you've been designed, you can't not matter. You can't not matter. You have something inside you. There's that need, if you will, inside of you to matter. But hear me on this. Now hear me. Don't miss this point because this is really important. Mattering in this life is not about what you can produce it is not about what you can achieve. 
It's not about the scope of our reach or how big our name can be or how large we can build our company or how big we can build our ministries. That has nothing to do with mattering. None of that answers the cry of the heart to matter. What is the Spirit talking about in verse 10 there? What is he saying? You were created in Christ beforehand. God created works, good works beforehand so that you could touch people's lives. The mattering that we do is actually relational. That's how we matter. The way we matter is through relating to one another. In in other words, the way that we find our need to matter fulfilled is by having an opportunity to bless and touch the lives of the people around us. To serve and to bless. And we know that's because that's what Jesus did. Um, I think it was like 30 years ago. It was a long time ago. There's a movie that came out called Mr. Holland's Opus. And there's a uh, this, this movie is about a man who had like this zeal and passion. He wanted to make an impact through music, through writing a symphony and creating this amazing stirring music that would touch the masses of people. He had this huge vision and huge dream, but through life circumstances or if you will, trial or tribulation or hardship, the world kind of kept knocking him down, and he ended up becoming a, just a, a, t- a music teacher in high school. And so he has got this vision for creating this amazing music, but what he finds his whole life is he's just teaching high schoolers how to do band, and play instruments. He ends up for the whole of his life doing that until the school cuts the music program and he's forced to retire. And you feel the weight of the disappointment and the hardship of his life. And he comes to uh, the end. It's his final day at the office, and he's leaving. And I just wanted to show you a clip from this movie. Now, what is that? Um, I don't know. What, you can't hear what's going on in the auditorium? Oh, yeah, I, I, I hear it. Well, there's something going on in here. Mm-hmm. This is supposed to be. Well, it could be someone No, the summer program don't start for another couple of weeks. Really? Yeah. 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 Master of Ceremonies seems to be a little late, so I guess it's up to me to begin. Um, When word first got out that the music program was cut and about the retirement of my husband, well, I've never seen such a response from the community. Oh, looks like my watch is fast. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, may I present our governor and... Kennedy High School alumnus, the most honorable Gertrude Lang. Mr. Holland had a profound influence. 
on my life, on a lot of lives I know. And yet I get the feeling that he considers a great part of his own life misspent. Rumor had it he was always working on this symphony of his, and this was going to make him famous, rich, probably both. But Mr. Holland isn't rich, and he isn't famous, at least not outside of our little town. So it might be easy for him to think himself a failure. And he would be wrong, because I think he's achieved a success far beyond riches and fame. Look around you. There is not a life in this room that you have not touched. And each one of us is a better person because of you. We are your symphony, Mr. Holland. We are the melodies and the notes of your opus. And we are the music of your life. something back to you, to you and to your wife, who along with you has waited 30 years for what we are about to hear. If you will, would you please come up here and take this baton and lead us in the first performance ever of the American Symphony by Glenn Holland. You have to rent the movie to listen to the song. <laughs> the easiest thing in the world is to think that we don't matter because we haven't done this and we haven't done that. When the truth is, is God has made us to matter by just doing this, to care for each other, to be here for each other to share with each other, to pour into each other. This is the most important thing. If you want to know what it means to be an image bearer, it means we've got to have a place to belong and a place to matter. We're supposed to want to matter, but it's not in the way that maybe the world might design it. It's the way in which God has made us to be, to touch each other's lives. We just want to give. And why? This is what our king did. He just gave. He served. And Jesus mattered, and it's amazing, Jesus mattered in the most profound way in giving his life. And yet, it is the example that he's given to us to be able to carry together. We want to matter. We're supposed to want to matter, but we get to do that with each other. We want to have safety. We want to talk about what needs we have. We want to be safe. And certainly we want to have physical safety as well. We want to belong and we want to matter, but we also want to be safe. And hear this, it's important to have walls and doors, but that's not really the needs of the heart, is it? What I mean by that is human beings need a safe place to go when you have totally blown it, when you failed, when you've fallen short, when you haven't measured up. Any perfect people in here just for... Anyone that's like totally perfect? Anyone? No. Anyone? Just, just checking. No, we've all fallen short. And here's what's so sad. I think often churches have been a place that have fostered a lot of toxic shame where we can't actually say, hey man, I've fallen short and I messed up. And I think what the scripture is saying is this is the place to do that. It's to have your people and say, hey, I've got to have a safe place to say I'm hurting. Or I've fallen short and I need help. I need. So we need safety. We need to belong. We need to matter. We need a safe place. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all of us. A friend loves at all times. 
Thank God for friends. And a brother is born for adversity. What an incredible thing. What's the Bible saying? This is on purpose. This life with each other is on purpose. You got to have a trenches friend, one that will jump into the trenches with you. We need a safe place, even a safe place to be sad. Galatians chapter 6 just says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need each other. We need safe places to be sad. We need safe places to be disappointed. We need safe places to be able to be real with each other. Finally, we, we, here's what we all need. We all need guidance. We need guidance. We need someone who can stand and say, I've gone down that road. Let me help you. Come on. All my sci-fi nerds, this is why you love Yoda. You love him. <laughs> or Mr. Miyagi or whoever you want to point to in all the cool 80s <laughs> movies. That's all the, that's the only ones I know. I'm really out of touch. But we value these characters in movies or we value these people in our lives who have just said, hey, here's a pathway. Here's a way that I can go. Here's a way that you might be able to experience and find life, right? We need someone who could just help show the way. Hey, how do you, you budget? And how do you uh, manage this when you're cross with your spouse and help me with that and all those kinds of things, right? We need, hey, how do you do this? And how do you do exercise? How do you die? How do you do these things? We need each other for that. We need guidance. We need help. It's what we were made to have. It's not a fun thing, I don't think. It's not a fun thing to have to think about what needs we do have. But here's what you and I aren't escaping this morning. You and I are needy people. We need God and we need friends. Now, will all of these people in the room be your besties? Probably not. But do you have a group of people that you can come to to be able to live real life, to belong and to matter, to encourage and to build up? Have you found yourself living in isolation in any way where you're kind of like going it alone? I know some of the loneliest marriages out there are the ones where they don't feel like they've got anyone else they could talk to and just say, hey, here's what we're experiencing. Are we normal? To the, and the answer is yes, you're normal. We need help. We need encouragement. Hey, we need help on parenting. and We need help on all of the things that we do and live in this life. God says, you don't, we're never meant to do this alone and never meant to do it in isolation. It's an opportunity to give our hearts first to God and then say, okay, God, who are my people so that I'm not doing this alone? So let's ask God to just begin to do that. Our team's gonna come up. We're gonna finish this morning in worship. You guys stand with me. We'll talk maybe some more practical ways that we can live this out next week as we finish out this series. If you're going like, oh, that sounds amazing, Pastor, but how do we do it? We're going to talk about that next week. But for this moment, I just want to say, let's come to the Lord as we finish and just say, okay, God, here are the places where I need, I need some help. I need encouragement. But let's be honest with the Lord. Let's bring it to the Lord and let's ask him about where we can begin to bring this together. Father, we're, we're just here to tell you first you are our supreme need. We need you, God. Would you just re-up that in your own heart where you have felt maybe tempted to go your own way, do your own thing? Where you have found yourself maybe just trying to skate by in life? And just come back home that's what the scripture would call us to come back home. And turn and just say, Lord, I want to give, give you my life again. I want to offer to you all of my need.
then two, here, would you do this? Would you say, God, here are the places I'm tempted to go it alone, where maybe I feel lonely. I don't feel like I've got anyone to share with, or I have a hard time feeling like I matter, or I have a hard time feeling like I belong. Any of those things, I don't feel safe. Would you just share that with God right now? tempted, Lord, to live in isolation in this way or to keep hiding. And I don't want to do that anymore. God, would you bring friends, your church, your people that I can be connected to, to live life with and be real with, share my wounds and share my hurts and share my failures, share my story. So that I can live life and life to the full in the midst of the ups and the downs of life. Life to the full. Fully alive. God, I'm asking that you would bring friendships and encouragements. People that we can be real and live life with and experience the fullness that you have for us. And we ask these things in accordance with your will, that we would be one just as you, Father, are one with the Son. Make us one. Connect us together. Help us to live fully in this life. That's what we're asking. We want to be abandoned to you, abandoned to your purpose, abandoned to your call, and abandoned to each other. Poured out trusting you to protect us and keep us safe as we live in this life. We thank you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship.